Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 17th, and my guest is Judith Curry of the Georgia Institute of Technology. She is professor and chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences there. She has a Ph.D. in geophysical sciences from the University of Chicago. She serves on the NASA Advisory Council Earth Science Subcommittee and has recently served on the National Academy's Climate Research Committee and the NOAA Climate Working Group. She's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Geophysical Union. And she's also president of Climate Forecast Applications Network, a consulting firm that helps clients make decisions that are affected by weather and climate. Her blog is Climate Etc., which can be found at judithcurry.com. Judy, welcome to Econ Talk. Well, thanks for the opportunity. We're going to talk about climate change, what we know and what we don't know. But before we do, I want to mention why I invited you to the program. A listener recommended you, so I checked out your webpage and I found something very surprising. There wasn't any yelling there, at least apparent yelling. There were thoughtful comments by you and your readers, and I read your rules for posting comments. They're a fantastic guide to civility. They seem to be working, and I was struck by how rare that environment is, especially in the area of climate change, which is so contentious. So in the spirit of civility, which I like to think is the spirit of this program, let's talk about climate change. In 2010, you testified before Congress and call climate change a wicked problem. What does that mean? Well, basically, it means that it's even hard to constrain it in terms of the dimensions. It's, uh, the more you consider the problem, the more dimensions and complexity the whole issue seems to have. And this is true not just of the physical and chemical and biological system that comprises the earth system and contributes to its climate, but also the social and economic dimensions that seem to feed back onto the physical climate system through our use of um, burning of fossil fuels, the decisions we make. Um, all of this is connected in a very complex way. And another characteristic of the wicked problem is that there's no simple solution and that every solution you propose seems to have unfortunate, unintended consequences. So climate change to me seems to be the archetypal wicked problem. So a lot of economists say it's an easy problem to solve. All we need to do is put on a carbon tax. We may struggle to figure out what the right amount is, but uh, that seems like a fairly narrow solution. It will have some consequences that are negative. Uh, there may be some unintended ones, but what's your take on that uh, approach of, well, we just need to reduce the amount of CO2 and uh, we know how to do that. We'll, we'll, we'll make it more expensive artificially through a tax. Well, two things. Even if we were successful – at reducing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere to, to the desired levels, we might not see any impact on the climate for 50 years or more. Um, further, the issue of extreme weather events, such as more hurricanes, more floods, more droughts, whatever, it, it remains unclear as to what extent um, those are actually becoming worse in any way that we can attribute to greenhouse gases. So what, even if we are successful at reducing CO2 emissions, exactly what impact this is going to have on our climate on time scales, you know, over the next 50 years is probably not very much. Why is that? And, why, why would it take 50 years for, let's say we did a, a fairly, um, I should tell you, Judy, that my background is, uh, I'm an economist, which I think you know, uh, and I'm a very, very casual consumer 
of, of the literature in this area. Uh, I'm a skeptic about our ability to model complex processes. So I come to the data and the models with some skepticism to start with. Uh, I'm skeptical of centralized solutions. Um, so I'm trying to – you're going to educate me today, and I, I assume I have some listeners who are in my, my, uh, my group, my, the same group as I – same boat as I am. Uh, but why would it take 50 years? We're going to you know, reduce the amount of CO2. Won't that, won't that uh, slow things down and bring them to a halt or even reverse them fairly okay, quickly? Well, well, CO2 – okay, some people talk to CO2 as a control knob you know, on the climate, but that control knob – really works on time scales more like centuries to millennia because of the um the way the earth system metabolizes stores and releases um carbon into the atmosphere the ocean stores a lot of heat okay and it, it takes, in terms of the turnover time of the ocean, it, it takes a while for, um, you know, heating and to to be realized in the atmosphere. So, so there's a lag in the system associated with the way the oceans store heat and the way carbon is stored in the atmosphere. I mean and the way carbon is stored in the oceans and in the land system, vegetation. So, so there's a lot of long-term feedbacks in the system that don't really allow, you know, changes in carbon dioxide to fine tune your weather or your climate. So that there's a lot of um, natural variability that contributes to climate variability and change related to the sun, volcanoes, and the ocean circulation system. So all of these things are going on on top of greenhouse warming. And greenhouse warming actually projects onto these other modes of variability. So the whole system is very complex, wicked, if you will. So there's um, you know, based on our understanding, there's really no way to fine tune the weather and climate um, by changing carbon dioxide concentrations. Well, it's funny you say that because the thing that comes to my mind as a, an economist is the way some macroeconomists talk about stimulus spending or government spending. We just need to – or the money supply depending on what flavor of economist you are. We just need to just tweak this variable. We have a control knob, they tell us. We've just been ignoring it or we haven't been tweaking it the right way or turning the knob the right way. And what you're suggesting is there's something similar in in climate. In the case of economics, when I say things like that, a lot of economists say, oh, you just don't understand. You, you know, it's not your field. Yeah. It's really – there's all of these studies that show that government spending stimulates the economy. And when we're in the doldrums like this, we just need to increase government spending. And I say, well, what about this event? What about that event? What about the models that don't predict so accurately? And I assume in your field, there are people who act like there's a knob. Um, are they wrong or am I wrong about that analogy? Okay. Well, actually, you know, when people – okay, it, it's a slow control knob. And, and when it, – it's more the advocacy groups and Al Gore, you know, will talk about, you know, as if you, there's some sort of fast control knob. But I think the people in the – you know, the IPCC and the climate scientists and, you know, don't regard it as a fast control knob. And in fact, you might have heard that there, the war, you know, the carbon dioxide that we've already admitted, that warming, there is warming in the pipeline for the next 50 years, even if we stopped um, <clears throat> emitting carbon dioxide. So, so, if you've heard warming's already in the pipeline, it's baked. Um, I've heard it's baked that's in. That's another way of of reflecting, you know, that it's not a fast control knob. That you know we're stuck with what we already have in terms of atmospheric CO two, and that's going to be, you know, contributing to a warming effect, you know, for the next fifty years or so. Even if we were to immediately drastically reduce CO two emissions. Do we know how big that warming effect would be if we did level things off, if we slowed or let's say – let's just say we could hold the amount of CO2 emitted annually 
by human beings constant. Do we have a, a prediction for what would happen 50 years from now? And if so, I'm sure we do. I'm sure we have many. Uh, and I'm sure they have decimal points like they do in macroeconomics. My question is, how accurate do you think those predictions are? And what kind of consensus, even though I don't think science is done via consensus, is there any consensus at all over the predictability of that change, meaning let's lock things in like they are now, 50 years from now, what will we get? Okay, the climate models are narrowing in, you know, and they all have a sensitivity, you know, to carbon dioxide about, you know, how much the climate would warm if you doubled and whatever. And, and the climate models generally give you in the first half of the 20th century, it would be about two degrees centigrade per decade of warming, okay, that we should expect from the climate models. And the fact that we really haven't had any warming since 1998, the temperatures, the global temperatures have been essentially flat for that period, um, tells us that the climate models, you know, aren't accounting for certain things. And there are a number of explanations for why we haven't, you know, warmed for the past, you know, 16, 17 years now. And people usually talk about, well, it's unpredictable variability. Well, okay, a lot of climate variability is unpredictable. And mostly that when they say unpredictable climate variability, this refers to the natural internal oscillations of the ocean atmosphere system. Well, what does that mean? Well, you've heard of El Nino and La Nina. Those are relatively short-term natural internal oscillations. And on longer multi-decadal time scales, there are things like the North Atlantic Oscillation and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation that are long-term, multi-decadal, you know, on timescales of variability on timescales of 60 to 70 years that have a very large impact on the climate. And what we've been seeing over the last period that we haven't had any cooling is a shift to the cool phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And this is largely regarded to be a major contributor to why we haven't had any warming. Now, the climate models don't do a good job at all with, say, the multi-decadal variability. So the climate models, you know, really haven't predicted something like this to happen in the presence of a, you know, ever-increasing carbon dioxide. And then there's we're in a cooling phase for the sun. Okay, this is looking up to be the, the coolest sun that we've seen in 100 years. And this is contributing to the warming. And this is something that the climate models can't predict. So, you know, these climate models are very good at predicting one little piece of it. You know, that the what the increasing carbon dioxide will do. But the problem is all other things aren't equal. We have, you know, the sun doing something unusual. We have this. Uh, just like you know, economics. The decadal. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so, so there's all these, you know, if you're looking at just one piece of it and trying to make it a simple problem, you know, that then they have a solution, you know, of, of this 0.2 degrees centigrade per de decade of warming. But the real climate system is much more complex with natural internal variability, particularly these multi-decadal oscillations in the ocean, um, solar variability, volcanoes are always a wild card, and things like changes in air pollution, changes in the regulatory environment, like continued decreasing of the chlorofluorocarbons, you know, to help with the ozone problem. All of these things also change the composition of the atmosphere in ways that are influencing the climate. So all of this adds up to, you know, no warming since, you know, for almost 17 years now. 
and climate scientists are still debating and trying to figure out what's going on. We have some subjective, you know, explanations and possibilities for what's going on, but something quantitative or having the models actually be able to predict something like this. Well, no, we're not there yet. Well, I'm glad so, you I'm glad you brought that up because um I was going to bring it up uh, as a data person uh interested in how people build hypotheses around data. When I look at and I went to the EPA site before um Environmental Protection Agency before our conversation just so I'd get a, a so-called unbiased so-called objective measure of, of the climate. <laughs> and you look at the data and as you say, the late 90s to today, it's it's flat. There's ups, there's downs, but it's it's basically flat. If you're looking at any other kind of data besides climate data, you say, well, whatever was causing th – there's two possibilities. Either we don't fully understand the, the, the mechanisms, which is always – almost always the case to some degree, or – Possibly the forcing variable, in this case, carbon dioxide hasn't been increasing. I, I get, went to another site and found that that's not the case. Or maybe there's something else that's changed that's, as you said, that's causing cooling, that in the absence of that, there would be warming. So because of that factor, we can't see the warming in the data. And that's, of course, possible. Yeah, hard to know uh, for sure, but it's it's always possible. But when you mention that flat temperature uh, reading over the last – 15 years or so, uh, people get really mad at you. Uh, I mentioned it to Jeffrey Sachs in a recent um, episode of this program, and he laughed at me and and sneered and said uh, – I can't remember what he said. I didn't look that up, but he he, he thought that was an, an incorrect way to think about things. Uh, I've been on the web because I found this so fascinating, and you hear things like, well, but they're the 10 – the last decades, the warmest decade in, in, in recorded history – uh, and I think, well, but it's not supposed to be flat. It's supposed to be rising because CO2 is the cause. And in general, the whole attitude to even suggest that there's been a, a, a stagnation in global temperature change is considered, um, I don't know, heretical. People get really mad. They don't go, well, it's more complicated than the nice tone of voice you just used. They get mad at you. Uh, do they get mad at you? Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. What do they, um, what do they say? Yeah, there's, what do they say and what do you say back? Oh, well, well I don't say anything back, actually. Um, I just let them say what they want. There are several blogs, you know, well, one blog that's just devoted to trashing me and several other blogs where it's a major part of their discourse trying to take every statement I make, place it in a different context, you know, and say very negative things about me. So... Um, there's a number of people who don't like what I'm saying, but what, what I'm trying, the, the, the thing that I've been saying, you know, for the past, you know, four years now is that we've oversimplified the climate problem, okay? By thinking everything is caused by CO2, we're missing a big part of the story and th this hiatus in warming you know, that this flat temperatures, you know, since 1998 and even earlier, you know, tells me that we have to pay a lot more attention to this natural internal variability and also solar variability in terms of explaining the past climate variability and also projecting into the future. And that's been my main message. And as a result of saying this, I show up on various people's list of climate deniers and things like that. And so my message, I think, is um, the appropriate one scientifically. And people who are making policy decisions need to have this more nuanced understanding because if they're wanting to do something to help reduce our vulnerability to climate variability and change on timescales of a few decades, by focusing on this very long-term issue of carbon dioxide, they're going to miss opportunities to deal with problems like reducing all our vulnerability to hurricane landfalls or to um, addressing issues of potential water shortages. By only focusing on the greenhouse warming aspect part of the problem, you know, we're missing opportunities to really reduce our vulnerability to 
these kind of issues which have the largest socioeconomic impact associated with climate variability and change. So that's been my message. And it's not a popular one because um, it goes contrary to the IPCC consensus. And any climate scientist who criticizes the IPCC or its consensus is automatically branded as a heretic. Um, and I don't think that's a healthy situation either for the science or for the environment, you know, for making policy decisions. So I'm going to read something I was going to read later, but I'll read it now. Uh, I happen, I personally find the term denier uh, repugnant for a whole bunch of reasons, but uh, I'm going to read this quote. Uh, this is from the Society of Environmental Journalists, which is um, – it's not a uh, – it's a guild of sorts. A, a, it's a club of, of journalists who write about the environment, and uh, someone there wrote on their website, I think, Judith Curry's blog, Climate, Etc., is an exception to the stereotype of denier blogs. Curry is a real climate scientist with strong credentials, committed to reason, evidence, and open inquiry. She is willing to examine legitimate points the climate skeptics may be making, as well as the evidence and arguments for mainstream climate science. Uh, I, I don't know what the opposite of damning with faint praise is, but that's it. Uh, that's a pretty good way to be described, it seems to me, as uh, – someone who writes about this topic. Well, yeah, I could almost put that in my mission statement for the blog. I mean, it describes perfectly what I'm trying to do, but but the irony of that is they accept, you know, without question that my blog is a denier blog. <laughs> you know, so so that really points out uh, sort of in, in my opinion the stupidity of applying the word denier to somebody who's trying to open the dialogue, you know, to discuss climate science and the policy implications beyond the narrow framework of the IPCC. Well, uh, keep, keep it up is all, is all I'll say. Um, let's talk about um, the water shortage issue you mentioned a minute ago. What is the issue there? Okay, well – we, we've had droughts, you know, from, you know, in the U.S. and globally, you know, ever recorded history, pre-recorded history is documented by tree rings. Droughts are nothing unusual. However, as population increases and energy systems rely on, you know, water availability for cooling, et cetera, um, our vulnerability is increasing. So, um our vulnerability to um, diminished water resources is one of the key concerns about climate variability and change. But I should add that overall, increasing carbon dioxide is expected to increase precipitation globally, although there are places where this might decrease. I mean, it's not uniform globally, but overall, you expect more rainfall. But that doesn't stop people from inferring that global warming um, is going to cause more droughts. And even the IPCC doesn't find huge evidence in most regions for any increase in droughts. And even if you do find an increase in droughts in a certain region, it's very difficult to attribute that to um, greenhouse warming. These multi-decadal ocean oscillations like the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation and Pacific decadal oscillation are very powerful controls on um, the decadal variability of droughts. And, and this really swamps anything that we can identify as a drought that might have been caused by global warming or um, you know, by greenhouse gases. Um, the other issue is that with, in many cases, well, I'll, I'll speak to the Southeast U.S., in, which, which is, you know, my, my home territory. Um, you, you think of the Southeast U.S. as a place with plenty of water, but actually in Atlanta and Alabama and Florida, the, the river basins that uh, feed the fresh water actually, you know, have a small catchment and very susceptible to drought. 
And, and so the region is very concerned about any possible change associated with greenhouse warming. And the models, the climate models are very ambiguous about, you know, whether it's going to increase by 20%, decrease by 20%. And the regional planners are very worried. And when I met with them, I think it was in 2011 to discuss this issue, I said, why are you worried about plus or minus 20% when the population of Metro Atlanta is scheduled to double, um, you know, on a time scale of 30 to 40 years? You know, and we're talking about a hundred percent change as opposed to this plus or minus twenty percent that we're worried about. Meaning, and also there are big meaning. There's bigger thing. You got to be worrying about that. For there's worry about bigger this. things yeah. to worry about than climate change. And there's also the tri-state water wars about how to share water between Alabama, um, Georgia, and Northern Florida. And you know that has the potential to change the water availability far more than anything related to climate change. So in a lot of these issues, when we think about our vulnerability to climate change, our vulnerability to climate change is really only a small piece of what should concern us. And people have an outsized worry about it relative to other things that they should be worrying about. So, you know, blaming everything on greenhouse gases and thinking that by reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, we're going to solve all our problems. Well, that's to me a naive fantasy in terms of not really understanding the full nature of our problems. And also it's naive about thinking, you know, we have this fine control knob on climate with CO2, which we don't. Should we worry about uh, sea level? Is that a legitimate worry, do you think? rising tide? Um, it, it is. Sea level is probably the one global, global issue um, that it's, you know, that you can attribute to an extent to uh, greenhouse gases. But sea levels have been rising for several centuries. Um, you know, people talk about coming out of the little ice age and that's sort of a nebulous term, but Sea levels have been rising for several centuries, and the big question is whether there's any acceleration that you can identify, you know, from greenhouse gases, and that's something that's hotly debated. In terms of looking at local sea level rise, say, say if, if you're looking at the New Jersey, New York area, which is, you know, highlighted as a result of Hurricane Sandy. Well, there's some natural, you know, land subsidence, and then there's also subsidence associated with land use. You know, as we, you know, build heavy buildings, as we withdraw the groundwater, there's a human-induced sinking. So a lot of the um, local sea level rise can often be attributed to um, either natural subsidence or to um, human land use. So, in, and in many places, this far um, overwhelms any sea level rise we're seeing associated with greenhouse warming. So, the whole sea level rise issue is quite complicated. You have to untangle the local, natural, and human land use contributions. And then you also have to um, when you're looking at global sea level rise issues, you have to understand how much of this is sort of natural, associated with natural internal variability and this long term coming out of the little ice age versus something that's being accelerated by greenhouse gases. So, you know, it's hard to untangle it, but looking forward, you know, if you're overall warming the climate, you know, you have you have a thermal expansion effect, you know, in the ocean where it makes it expand and so sea level rises and that's not too much. Again, the bigger wild card is how much, you know, the glaciers are going to melt. So um, once you melt the great glaciers, it's like adding more ice cubes, you know, into your glass of water once they melt. Um, you know, it causes the level of water in your glass to rise. And, and so that's the wild card. 
Um, so, but if it gets but then the if glaciers it gets, also have if it gets warmer, and, they're, they're going to melt, right? Yeah, they're going to melt, but but th th there's it, it's it's not that simple. Often, as it gets warmer, there's more snowfall in the high latitudes, so you can be accumulating glacier mass. So, um, trying to look at the mass balance of the glaciers, um, accumulation, melting, and then calving, where pieces actually break off, you know, is a is a complex problem, and. It's really only for the last decade or so that we've had really good satellite observations that help us keep track of the mass balance. But even then, it's not simple to interpret these satellite observations and to infer glacier mass balance. And so like in Greenland, where we're having like actually having some accumulation, a lot of snowfall on the northern part, it seems like there's melting on the southern part. And on the southeastern part, there's a lot of calving of glaciers. And trying to understand how this all adds up to, you know, is it losing mass? Well, on Greenland, it does seem to be losing mass. But to what extent is this natural variability associated with the ocean oscillations or greenhouse warming? Again, sorting all that out, you know, is still fairly ambiguous. So how to attribute this to greenhouse warming is, is very tricky. So, you know, there's still a lot of uncertainties in how to interpret all of this and how to, and even if we can identify, okay, the glaciers are losing mass, to what extent is this simple warming from carbon dioxide or related to these um, natural internal variability? So, so I'm going to, I'm going to take, you, you know, that there's, okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, so, so there's no simple interpretations to all this that are unambiguous in terms of what carbon dioxide is doing and how we, we, we have a sense that in general, this would be, you know, melting, warming, but so, so there would be melting glaciers that would contribute to sea level rise, but there is also increases that are potentially associated with greater snowfall and how to sort all that out, you know, remains rather unclear. And there are differing interpretations, you know, in the scientific literature. So that's a sign that, you know, that this is still a relatively, it's not a very mature field in terms of our understanding. I'm, I'm going to ask you a more general question, but before I do, I want to I want to stick with ice for a minute. Do you want to say something about the polar bears? Okay, the, the polar bears have you know been an icon for you know global warming, and you know in some regions the populations are increasing, in other regions they seem to be decreasing. There's a you know a hot debate you know amongst biologists as to exactly what's going on with the populations and then how to attribute any changes in the populations to global warming. So I think a lot of people have dropped the polar bears as an icon for global warming because it doesn't really seem that the populations are shrinking at all, or at least in any way that can be attributed to global warming. I think you're seeing a lot of people drop the polar bears as an icon for global warming because that doesn't seem to be holding up. Well, uh, I think it's Happy Feet uh, is the movie where the, the polar bears are uh, having a tough time. Maybe they'll issue a sequel. Um, I want to ask a general question because, again, it, a lot of what you're saying reminds me of the way I feel about macroeconomics. So when I think about macroeconomics, I'm uh, – I'm what I like to call a late Hayekian. The early work of F.A. Hayek, he was trying to create a, a better, more general, global, micro-based model of business cycles and and how the economy varied. And he he gave up on that for a whole bunch of reasons, one of which is I think it's just too hard. And in his later years, certainly in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, he's much more agnostic uh, and skeptical would be a better word about our ability to model the macroeconomy in any precise way. 
It says we understand general trends, uh, certain forces that are at work, but to suggest that we can steer it or uh, manipulate it is, is, a, is a fantasy. And when I say things like that, people say – or when I say, for example, really very similar to the, what you just said, when I say the economy is complex, we don't understand all the causal forces, we can't control it, uh, they say, well, that's just an excuse. You don't want to do anything. Uh, you're just finding – you're just saying, well, it's all complicated. And I'm going to give, throw that back at you. I, I have my own response in the economics, which, which is – my first response is I'd say first do no harm. Uh, and I don't – and I see a lot of evidence that when we think we can control things uh, and we can't, we actually do a lot of harm. Uh, but in the climate area, a lot of people say, well, it's better safe than sorry. So, OK, we're not sure. You say we're not sure about the, the sea level, what causes it. We're not sure if it's – if Greenland and, and glaciers are melting or shrinking. There's snowfall. The polar bears are shrinking and expanding in other, some places. Um, we're not sure of the role of volcanoes and the sun and all these – ocean effects. But isn't it better safe than sorry? Wouldn't it be better to – okay, so it's not a tight knob. It's not a great control knob, carbon dioxide. But since we know it has some effect, uncertain perhaps in terms of the magnitudes, wouldn't it be better just to – as an application of precaution to let's let's dial it down, better safe than sorry? And this is, by the way, the position that Robert Pindyke, uh, the economist, took on this program uh, Earlier this year, he said, yeah, we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. The models are, are mediocre, but the, we should just – better safe than sorry. We should – we we know it's some effect, and so we may, may not know the perfect way to cope with it, but we know we, we should do something. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, I mean I'm – I guess I'm in the same camp as you. First, do no harm, and, and I think the, the push to um, – Biofuels is an example where we thought we could do something that was relatively quick and easy, and there seemed to be a lot of unintended adverse consequences on soils, on food prices, and it seems that even overall it's not even reducing greenhouse gas emissions, that the net change on all this might not be anything. So, so that's an example of doing something that you thought would help, okay, that actually is harmed. Okay, if you step back from a minute, for, for a minute about, you know, the precaution, you know, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you know, as a precaution. Well, if clean green energy is the same price as dirty energy, I think people would naturally prefer to use the cleaner sources of energy. I mean, that that's just... Um, I think people prefer clean energy, but they don't want to sacrifice the abundance or the ready availability of the energy, and they don't want to pay too much more for it. So until we figure out how to make sure the clean energy would be abundant and cost competitive, it's, I think it's going to be a very tough sell. Um, you know, are we going to sacrifice, you know, the availability, especially in the developing world, that there's, it's, it's a very different problem in the U.S. where they don't have enough power as it is. And there's, you know, part of their, a key element of their development goals is more abundant power. And there's no obvious way to provide all that they need with purely green energy. Although some countries like India are making really good progress you know, in terms of implementing um, solar power and things like that, it, it's just a very tough thing to do. So you have to look at the unintended consequences. You know, when, when you're applying the precautionary principle, I mean, to me, it's, it's a mistake just to look at one piece of it and not consider the unintended consequences. So... Again, that's one of the hallmarks of the wicked problem framing is that no matter what you propose to do, you know, there are unintended consequences and you have to ask, is the cure worse than the disease? Um, even with, you know, until we get better battery storage for wind and solar, um, it's not clear that those power sources are actually at least say in the U.S. are actually helping us reduce CO2 because when the wind dies out, then you have to quick crank up 
the gas burners and the spin up for that, you know, ends up, you know, using as much fossil fuels as, as you might have been saving from when you did get the wind energy. So, you know, what the actual savings are isn't always obvious and what the unintended consequences are need to be looked at. So again, the key issue is if we can figure out technologies and infrastructures to make clean energy available at approximately the same cost as fossil fuels, okay, that then we're ready to make the transition. But until then, you know, it's hard to justify this on a very massive scale. I mean, various regions, you know, will experiment um, and some things will work and some things won't. So I think it's you know very interesting what California is trying to do, et cetera. Again, that's a very wealthy state. They can afford to experiment, you know, in ways that, say, um, Africa may not want to experiment. Right. Well, that's right. Because, you know, they're, they're, they're desperate for um, energy and coal is the cheapest and most obvious way to provide them with that energy. So how do you make those calls when you balance, you know, all the various issues? You know, and again, I'm just waffling and saying, you know, complex problem, uncertainty, whatever. But at the end of the day, I, I think we will, we are transitioning to cleaner energy and there's lots of reasons beyond greenhouse warming to transition to cleaner energy, I guess, especially coal burning and the small particulate issue. That's a major health issue. I mean, it's a huge health issue in Asia, in China and, you know, Bangladesh and India. It's, it's just a huge issue in terms of air quality. It's a massive public health issue. So I think they're motivated to try to get away from coal burning, you know, as a public health issue. Not only are they poisoning the air, but also their water and even the soils where it's, you know, their soils are losing productivity, you know, because of all the pollution. So if you can, if you have another reason for moving to clean green energy besides just the greenhouse warming issue, then I think you have, you know, a, a winning solution. So trying to bring in other aspects, you know, whether it's economics or environmental quality, public health, national security, you know, if those issues are also um, drivers for going to clean energy, then it doesn't seem like such a potential risk just going to clean energy over the global warming issue. I mean, that's my take on how to think about the problem. And again, it's it's mushy, um, but I think it's consistent with global warming and the energy issues as being wicked problems. So you've you've been out of. I'm going to move on to a, to a broader topic, and we'll come back to some climate issues in a minute. But uh, you've been out in the um, out of school, out of graduate schools for about uh, 25 years or so. That's about how long I've been out. And when when you come out of graduate school, I think inevitably you have some romance about the enterprise you're involved in. And it's um, – there are many, many non-monetary aspects of being an academic that are that are inspiring and uh, exciting. But I, I wonder how you feel the way – how you feel about how your particular field has changed as you've grown up in it and, and been out for 25 years. Um, do you think that – the academic world as it's currently constituted, the returns to publishing and and the way that academics are successful, are they conducive to truth seeking? Do you feel that the uh, that we're making progress in how in the scientific world on your on this particular topic, or are we in trouble? Oh, I, I think we're in big trouble. Okay, when I left graduate school. Um, nobody called themselves a climate scientist. They were an atmospheric dynamicist or a geochemist or a physical oceanographer or things like that. And we were all focused on, fundam you know, increasing fundamental understanding, you know, and that was the focus. And, and it was it was the breakthrough in understanding, changing the way people think 
was what mattered. Okay. And somebody who published too many papers was probably looked at with suspicion as they're doing, you know, the quick and easy stuff. They're not really digging in, you know, it was potentially superficial. Um, the other thing that was looked down upon, say in the eighties was doing something that was too applied, um, you know, working to deal with regional problems or something like that, that, that was viewed as soft core. It was what the people did who couldn't really make fundamental contributions to understanding. So they moved on to some of these applied topics, which were useful, you know, in some way to regional decision makers. Okay. I would say in 2000, you know, it was a gradual transition, but I think in circa 2000, there was a switch to people finding it beneficial to self-label them, you know, as a climate scientist. And there was a lot of money, you know, research dollars in this area. There was a lot of um, influence to be had in terms of, you know, sitting on panels and boards and committees and being interviewed by journalists and being invited to testify in front of Congress. And so the value and the influence of a scientist sort of switched, you know, into that dimension where your measure of influence was not so much how you increased our fundamental understanding of how the oceans work, but it was really to what boards and committees you sat on, um, your presence and your press, um, and your influence in policy, being invited to testify in front of Congress and whatever. So, so I've seen, you know, that switch and the, the problem, you know, the, the concern that I have for the health of our field is that there's still a lot of fundamental things that we don't understand. You know, the climate models aren't good enough. We need to go back to basics, increase our understanding about the, you know, the nonlinear dynamics of all these ocean oscillations and complexity of, you know, the system and things like that. There's a lot of fundamental things that are getting short shrift. The, the sex appeal in our field right now and a lot of funding is, is to do what I call mo climate model taxonomy, where people are analyzing the output of climate models and finding something interesting, alarming, or using them to infer that we won't be able to grow grapes in California in 2100 or something like this. This is the stuff that gets published in Nature and Science and PNAS and people, you know, get a the press New York release. Times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. And they get a press release and there's a lot of funding in this area. And I call this climate model taxonomy. And because I don't have confidence in climate models, you know, on regional spatial scales. So I think the whole impacts game related to climate models is rather pointless. And also they really don't get that natural internal variability, so they can't really say anything on time scales of 50 years. So I think there's this whole field of climate model taxonomy that's very well funded and gets all the headlines that is pointless scientifically. It's not increasing our understanding of anything, and I think it's fundamentally misleading to decision makers because the climate models aren't good enough on those space and time scales. And so that there's not a, and, and so the, the newer generation of climate scientists broadly defined are seeing a lot of rewards in the climate taxonomy area. And it's very relatively easy work. And I think it's uh, personally pointless. It's not fundamentally useful to the decision makers and it's not increasing our fundamental understanding. So I'm not happy you know, with the way all this is going. And, you know, I'm, I'm, have been chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech since 2002. And I've tried to do my hiring in what I would call the fundamental areas, you know, trying to 
to increase our fundamental understanding rather than what I would call climate model taxonomy. And there is pressure for me to hire, you know, in, you know, climate modelers, not people, not so much people who are, you know, working to develop fundamentally new types of climate models. I'd be definitely interested in that, but people who are just using the output of climate models. And I don't think that's a useful way for our science to go. So, you know, I've, you know, I, I fight that on my own little square of turf, but it's very hard to find even good people to hire who are doing fundamental work. That There's a lot of people in what I would call the, the chemistry aerosol cloud interactions doing very fundamental work that's very exciting. And, and I think this is where a lot of the good fundamental physicists and chemists who are interested in climate are working in that area. So that area is very, is very vibrant. But what I would call the more climate dynamics, you know, the fundamental fluid dynamics of the atmospheres and oceans, it's, I found it very hard to, to find good people who are making fundamental advances in our understanding. Well, I'm not so surprised, concern, right? I'm not surprised. Yeah, those, are the hard, yeah. those are the hard problems when you're fresh out of graduate school. You're told, don't work on those. You won't get tenure. You might work on it for 10 years and get nothing, and you're going to be out of a job. So Yeah, exactly. You can get lots of publications and lots of citations by doing climate model taxonomy. So, you know, that's a concern that I have. Um, and, and it's the older, you know, I, I never thought I'd live to see the day when I'm one of the old farts, the older generation. But a lot of the fundamental wave dynamics and fluid dynamics that was emphasized in the 70s and 80s, I mean, those people are on the verge of retirement. And, you know, in terms of even educating the the new students in these areas, I'm just wondering where all that's, you know, where that's going to come from. So, So I am concerned about... And, and 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 the awards that are given in professional societies, okay. And I said this past year I was on the um, fellows award committee for the American Geophysical Union, and you know the, the first knee jerk reaction is to look at the number of publications in the so called H index, which is related to people's scientific citations. But that makes it scientific. That can be mis- <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, you're right. It's quantifiable. Yeah. But again, the people who are working on the very hard problems and don't have that same kind of productivity or citations, um, it's harder to, you know, to push them through. And, you know, it, it, it's a lot harder to make the case. And, and personally, I work hard <laughs> to make the case for, for people who I think, you know, are doing a good job in those areas. But again, the recognition is skewed towards number of publications, citations, and people who are doing something that catches the attention of the media. And again, climate model taxonomy, you know, is a very easy path to fame and fortune in climate science, but I, it, it, it's not getting us where we need to go. And so I, <laughs> you know, ultimately in terms of the increasing our fundamental understanding and really giving decision makers something that they can use. So let's let's look at the other side. So the same thing happens in economics. The you know if if you uh, if you can make a case for uh, government intervention, you're, you're going to usually get invited to the better cocktail parties, and you're going to be more politicians are going to be more attentive to you, and you're more likely perhaps to get quote in the media, which is always pleasant and adds to to your uh, pocketbook in various ways, not directly but indirectly. And in the grant making obviously has something to do with that as well. And I look at climate science and I see that phenomenon. I see people who have an opportunity to be on the right side, the side that has the moral high ground right now. And I understand the incentives that people face about how to think about what to work on and what side they come down or what evidence to consider. But on the other side, the, the the climate advocates, the people who advocate intervention and act in action, they say, well, it's, it's just as bad or worse. They'll say it's worse on the on the climate skeptic side. Those folks, people who are skeptical about climate or think we don't know what we're talking about or 
or talk about complexity as you do. They're just pawns of industry. They're people who get a lot of money from uh, typically the fossil fuel industry, and they're just uh, they're just saying what they're paid to do. And and of course, being paid by um, by an oil company is is much worse than being paid by the uh, the EPA or by uh, a government agency in terms of prestige. So, what's your response to that? A lot of people, okay. maybe maybe you're one of them. Maybe you're a pawn of industry, Judy. I, I like you. You seem nice. And I want to believe what you say, but maybe you have the same issues. Is that true? And do you think that's true of people who generally are skeptical about climate? Okay. I think this whole pawns of industry thing is is just a, a, a red herring. Um, you know, the Merchants of Doubt book, you know, by Oreski, Naomi Oreski, you know, she identifies some people like Fred Singer and people that really aren't big players in the public debate on climate change at this point. The only person that I know that's making money off of being a climate skeptic is Pat Michaels. <laughs> okay, he's managed to make money off of it. That's not his primary motivation, but he has made money off of it. And it doesn't mean he's I mean, wrong, by the way. I think it's always important when people no, point it, out these things. It, it, it doesn't mean he's wrong. It's an interesting it argument. He, he, it's not decisive. Right, right. He, he's a sufficiently how shall I say, stubborn, loose cannon, say what he thinks, he's not going to be bought by anybody. But the point is, you know, what he says is found attractive by certain people, and he's attracted some money that way. So Pat Michael is the only person that I know of that makes money off of this. Okay, in the interest of disclosure, I my company, Climate Forecast Applications Network, the target of a lot of what we do is the energy sector, but it's really short-term weather forecasting, you know, time scales of days to weeks. And, and so there, there's nothing in what I do for the energy sector that has anything to do with climate change. And I don't think any of my climate clients have ever actually even asked me about climate change, although I know a few of them follow the blog. So I do have some contracts with regional um, power providers and even one um, big energy company to do short-range weather forecasting of heat waves, of hurricane landfalls, things like that that are of relevance to the energy sector. But um, my position, um, either way, my the, the one big oil company, actually, uh, this contract started in 2006, and we got this contract. They were attracted to our position on hurricanes and global warming, a big paper that we had published from Georgia Tech that, made, you know, where, where we saw an increase in the percentage of um, category four and five hurricanes. And they thought that we had some new insights to understand um, how to predict hurricanes. Okay, and, and so that actually attracted to the them to us in the first place, although what we ended up doing for them actually had absolutely nothing to do with global warming. And since then, my position has skipped, you know, has shifted to be more skeptical about the global warming issue. So ironically, the contract that we have with the big oil company was originally attracted by the position that we had that um, warmer temperatures were causing an increase in hurricane intensity. So, I mean, that's a full disclosure of my connection with oil companies, but my opinion about global warming obviously has nothing to do with the fact that I have some oil company clients. So I think that, to, you know, to me, that is a big red herring, this issue that the scientists that I talk to, and there are many people who do not make public statements about global warming, but remain quite skeptical of the IPCC. But they don't speak publicly because, among other reasons, they have no inclination to. But they also see what happened to me when I spoke out on this issue in terms of being labeled a denier and a heretic, and they don't want to, you know, bring that sort of thing down upon their own head. So... Yeah, I, I think the, I think of, the social factors are, are quite significant beyond the monetary ones. And the IPCC is just the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for those of you who, who want to look it up at, uh, on the web. 
um, that issues reports right on the state of climate and and makes policy recommendations as well. Um, so here's the interesting question, and we're almost out of time. But here's the interesting question: Let's suppose you were a paid, not not you have a contract with an oil, with a global with a big oil company to work on short term meteorological stuff. But let's say you were you were a consultant for the oil company, a spokesperson. Now, in theory, that doesn't change any single thing that you've said so far today, it, right? What you've everything you've said so far today, you said intending at least, as far as we can tell, to be spoken as a scientist and. The problem, of course, is that those of us out here in the hinterland, uh, just as it is in economics as well, we don't know very much. So we look for experts. And my general rule is that all experts are biased. It may not be monetary. It may be intellectual. It may be ideological. Everybody's got baggage. And the way we assess truth isn't by saying, well, who's got the least baggage? Because they must be telling the truth. The way we assess truth is by seeing whose evidence stands up. Uh, whose evidence proves correct, whose theories are confirmed, whose are challenged, etc. But the problem is for those of us who are just mere citizens and not your fellow scientists, um, what's a citizen to do? People ask me this all the time about economics. They say, well, there are all these different theories of economics. Which one's the right one? And I'm always tempted to say, well, just pick one that feels good because you'll find some evidence for it and you'll feel like you're doing the right thing. But that's not really what we want to do. We'd really like to know what is really true. So what's your advice for people out here in who are not specialists, who are not trained formally in, in climate change or even in data analysis? How do you find out what's real and what's not real? Who's How do you find out something close to the truth? Well, I, I think, again, and I think the framing of the wicked problem, you know, is, is, is useful here. Like, it, it's so complicated that we don't really understand it very well. Okay, we understand aspects of it, but there are other aspects that we don't understand, and we continue to be surprised by what nature dishes out, you know, in front of us. So, again, this is why I think the wicked problem is a is a useful one for framing to the public. And in terms of biases, I, I think, and I write a lot about you know, you know, the social psychology of science and understanding biases and trying to weed out biases and trying to identify them. And I've become, you know, I've been reading that literature for the last maybe three years or so, basically, since I've been working on the blog a lot. And it's really illuminating to me to try to uncover my own biases. And, you know, we all have them. And I think self-awareness you know, by scientists and by members of the public is an important thing, is an important thing. So, so trying to understand your own biases and be aware of them and hidden biases and, oh, I didn't think that would be a source of bias, but now that I think about it, it probably is. So everybody has biases, but it's a job of scientists to try to weed those out and be as objective as we possibly can. So I view it is this is part of the scientific process is to try to weed out our biases and be as objective as we can. And when you hear, you know, disagreement and debate about an issue such as climate change, again, the conflicts are not over only over science, but they're also about values and they're also about politics. And sometimes these things get hopelessly mixed up. And I would argue that in the climate change debate, values, politics, and science have gotten rather muddled, um, not just in the public debate, but even in the minds of scientists. So, again, there's no simple solution. And if you're interested in trying to understand this issue better, I encourage you to engage with some of the blogs, you know, pick a couple of blogs and read the posts and the comments and even consider participating. I think a lot of people who engage in the blogs and participate in the discussion um, do learn a lot of things about the science itself and also about the public debate and the political trade-offs. And a lot of people you know, even though they're partisan, you know, and inclined towards one side or the other, I think a lot of the people who, who are partisan also do check out some of the opposing blogs just to see what's going on and as a check. 
So I think the blogosphere is, is really a, an interesting development that can help, you know, people engage and understand what the debate and controversies are all about. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think um, you have to pick them wisely. You have to pick ideally some people on both sides of an issue and see what what people say and how they talk about it. Uh, your remark about uh, self-awareness strikes a chord with me, as listeners will know. It reminds me of the wonderful quote from Richard Feynman, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. So it's good general advice that we should be um, aware of our biases. And I think one way to do that is to read – Don't just don't read the ones you already agree with. Agreed. My guest today has been Judith Curry of Georgia Tech University. Judy, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it a lot. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>